Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1987 release, Evil Dead 2. And yes, this is one I've owned for quite some time. This also, much like The Evil Dead, which I recently reviewed, uh, I have not seen in quite a while. Uh, not nearly as much. Uh, Evil Dead, the original The Evil Dead, it had been like 20 years since I had seen that one. This one, probably closer to like 10, but still a lot of years. So uh, the interesting thing is that Looking back, uh, before I had rewatched them, you know, just very recently, I had been thinking, man, I really prefer Evil Dead 2. I like that so much more. Well, after watching them back to back now, as I'm much older, um, I really prefer the original a lot more. And a lot of that has to actually do with tone of the film. There are some things that I appreciate more about the second one, like kind of upping of some of the gore and, you know, a little bit of the comedy I kind of like, but... Overall, the tone, I, I like that it was more of a serious tone in the first one with a little bit of comedic hints to it. In the second one, it seems like I'm not really digging the slapsticky stuff after watching the first one because watching the second one, even though I do quite like it still, uh, it just makes me really want a sequel that was more like the first one. It was more serious with maybe just little hints of comedy. I, I guess it's just like that three stoogy slapsticky thing which it is three stoogy because as i've found in many places research wise uh, uh sam raimi was a big fan of three stooges so he intentionally when he was doing comedic stuff would kind of make it like that and you know like speeding up the camera work is one of the ways that he did it with a lot of the slapsticky stuff so anyway <clears throat> evil dead 2 Directed by Sam Raimi after his flop film that he did with the Coen Brothers, Crime Wave, which has been said almost killed Raimi's career. Thankfully, there were people still interested in doing uh, the Evil Dead type films. Uh, it was written by Raimi and also Scott Spiegel, who did the films Thou Shalt Not Kill Unless, which Bruce Campbell was in, Intruder, The Rookie, The Nut House. And Dusk Till Dawn 2, Texas Blood Money, which I have not seen that one. But maybe I'll do the whole series of Dusk Till Dawns. Is that a bad idea? I don't know. Put a comment down there. Obviously, Bruce Campbell's back in this. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to note is that at showing up in this film as the character of Annie is Sarah Barry, who I thought did a pretty good job. She only has one other real feature-length film movie credit, acting-wise. And uh, that's in Chud 2, Bud the Chud. And she's just in there as onlooker. So what happened? What happened? Was was Evil Dead 2 too much for her and then she was done? I don't know. The budget was $3.5 million and it ended up making $10.9 million. So yes, still quite profitable, much like the first film. Oh, excuse me, I'll move my light just a little bit there. Sorry, fixing things while recording. Not the best, but do what I can. Anyway, Stephen King brought the project to producer Dino De Laurentiis, which is cool because if you remember when I was talking in the review of the first one, uh, it was Stephen King who really got uh, eyes on The Evil Dead because he had seen it, he loved it, he did a very positive review on it and really pushed it out there. And then that's when New Line Cinema decided to pick it up because it gained so much steam. Now, here's Stephen King again helping them out and getting helping to get the second film made. So he went to Dino De Laurentiis for this, who was a producer at that time on the film he was working on, Maximum Overdrive, which was, is it the only film that Stephen King has directed? It's at least the first that he directed. I think it might be the only film he's directed. I'm sure someone will have that info for me in the comments. Uh, and after talking to him, he was able to get him to agree to bankroll uh, Evil Dead 2. Um, so... Raimi had actually, this is another interesting connection, Raimi had previously been offered to direct a Stephen King adapted film, Thinner, by Dino De Laurentiis, and he had passed on that, he just wasn't interested. Um, I think he had passed on that to do Crime Wave, actually, yeah. Raimi wanted to go the route of the time travel aspect of it and take it back to the Middle Ages, which obviously is what we get for Army of Darkness, um... But De Laurentiis wanted something a lot more similar to what happened in the first film, so he steered away from that. So, yeah. But thankfully, we got another one, and that's why we got Army of Darkness, which was going to be basically the second film. If it wasn't for Dino De Laurentiis saying, hey, my money, let's not do it that way. So, 
pretty interesting, which Army of Darkness came out in 1992, and I will be doing a review of that one as well. One of the concepts almost used for this film, and I'm glad they didn't use it because it seems really stupid, was the idea of a group of escaped convicts who kidnap Bruce Campbell and are holding him at the cabin. And then obviously things get crazy, and they're apparently looking for buried treasure. Like, that's a dumb concept, but apparently it was almost used. I'm glad it was not. What they used was better than that. So Tom Sullivan returned for the practical effects, but he wasn't alone. He also worked with Vern Hyde, Doug Beswick, and names people will know, Mark Showstrom, and Greg Nicotero. Much bigger names than Hyde and Beswick, and Sullivan for that matter. Uh, the possessed hand aspect of the film was actually derived from a short film that Spiegel had made when um, many years prior, and <laughs> very. this is very funny to me when I was reading it. So that short film he made about that possessed hand was inspired by the advertisements for the Hamburger Helper. You know, it's like the glove hand that, like, talks. So he had this idea of, like, someone having a possessed hand. So that's how it got there. It's a weird... So really, you can tie Evil Dead 2 to Hamburger Helper, which is just... It's very odd. Uh, Ted Raimi plays Henrietta in this, the uh, Deadite Henrietta, which was the mother of Annie's character who became a deadite and was in the basement of the place. So Ted Raimi literally sweated buckets when he was in that full outfit. Apparently it was insanely hot and it was so bad that in between takes Greg Nicotero would come over and they'd have to like dump the sweat out of the suit into Dixie cups and then go and like throw it out because they didn't you know, it, it would start ruining the suit if it was so waterlogged. And apparently, if you really pay attention, in some of the scenes where Henrietta, where Raimi's in the Henrietta outfit, you can see, like, sweat running out of the ear, one of the ear holes. I couldn't see that when I was watching, but apparently you can. So rumor has it there's a Freddy glove that appears in the film, which a lot of people talk about. Now, rumor has it that it was actually borrowed from the set of Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, because Mark Showstrom at that time was working on that for practical effects. So I don't know if that's accurate. It's like this rumored thing that he just took it from the set, used it for the day for shooting, and then took it back. I mean, that would make sense. But then again, maybe they kind of like just made their own. I don't know. Now, something to kind of clarify from my review on The Evil Dead is that I was talking about the how in the basement scene when they first go down there, there's a partially ripped poster, and it's for The Hills Have Eyes. So I didn't know the connection at that time um, to The Hills Have Eyes, but there is this series of connections. So apparently in The Hills Have Eyes, there is in the trailer a ripped poster for Jaws. Now, as a nod to Jaws, you know, Wes Craven really liking Jaws. So in The Evil Dead, Sam Raimi decided to do the same thing, and he put the ripped poster in the basement for The Hills Have Eyes as a nod to Wes Craven. So after that... And it, what ended up happening is in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, they had, uh, Wes Craven had Evil Dead showing on the TV. I think it's the part when one of the characters is falling asleep. I think Johnny Depp's character, maybe. And then after that, in return, was the Freddy Glove showing up in Evil Dead 2. So I saw it was this cool kind of back and forth if people didn't know about it. But maybe you did. I don't know. In which case, sorry to bring it up again. I don't really like the narration in the beginning of the film. Uh, the stop motion that goes along with the narration is cool, and I always appreciate old school stop motion. Anytime I can watch like a Ray Harryhausen film, um, I'm down. I'm going to be watching the original Clash of the Titans in the next few weeks just for fun because I love the stop motion stuff. Plus, that's just a fun movie. Uh, but I do think they really should have stuck just for revealing backstory for this film. They should have kind of did it the way they did in the first one, which is just go through those recordings, uh, which they do it a little bit, a little bit early, uh, later on in the beginning of Evil Dead 2. But I, I just, it then reinforces to me, like, why do you have these two ways that you're revealing backstory? So to start it with that narration and the, the stop motion, once again, stop motion is cool. But you just don't need it, and it's a weird way to start, and I just, I didn't like that aspect. Sorry, it's not my thing. I'm not sure why they chose to change the events of the first film. It just seems like a really odd thing to do. Like, the friends are gone. They don't even exist. Um, I guess some people could say that it was like a time travel type thing then. 
Although there's really no indication that that's the case. It just seems like they just kind of rewrote history with the first film. You know, they do show that he had, you know, Linda's a girlfriend and she turned into a deadite and he had to kill her. But there's no friends involved or anything. The house isn't all screwed up. The bridge thing never, never happened. It happens later. Um, or no, it, di it did happen, actually. That actually did happen. But um, just the fact that they changed some events, I don't understand. I think it just would have made a lot more sense if they just picked up where the first one literally left off. Where the, the evil is rushing through the woods, rushes through the cabin, and hits Bruce Campbell. They do that again in Evil Dead 2, but I don't understand why they had to recap that and change the past. I just I, I just don't get it. But uh, subscriber Uncle Pete to my channel has told me that what he does is he watches the Evil Dead, and then when he watches Evil Dead 2, he just skips the beginning portion and just starts where Bruce Campbell gets hit with the evil. Smart idea. I think I'm going to do that going forward. So the puddle at that Ash ends up in when he's kind of like the evil is trying to take him over after he gets hit with it, it seems like a callback to the mirror that turned into a puddle in the evil dead. Now it then is used again when mirror, when Ash sees himself in the mirror and then the, the mirror Ash jumps through and starts choking him. And then it reveals that he's choking himself. Then Ash turns back to normal when he sees a mirror, that mirror like pendant that Linda had on her, as her necklace. So I think it's a very interesting thing where they're using this mirror concept of turning from good to, uh, to evil and evil back to good, which is interesting too, because it then shows that there's the ability for people to be reminded of something and basically force the evil out of their body because the, the pendant is what kind of does that for Ash. And it happens again later. I'll talk about that, but it happens with Henrietta as well. So... I'll just bring it up again then. Uh, like in the first one, the curled up bridge is a cool visual, especially the wide shot. They didn't do a wide shot in the first movie, but in this one, like that wide shot just looks so cool. It gives you an idea of how big the chasm is that they would have to get past. You get so much more of the evil rushing through the woods, and it still looks great. It's still amazing. And one of my favorite things that is kind of more of a slapsticky thing was... Um, when it's chasing Ash throughout the cabin in the beginning, that's fun. You know, it's slapsticky, it's funny, but it's fun too. Um, so I quite like that. Uh, the, pl the piano playing itself, and then it turns to kind of background music uh, for Ash uh, getting sentimental and sad about the fact that he lost Linda. Uh, I thought that was kind of a cool transition because at first it's like, oh, the Deadites are here, they're playing the, the piano, and then it just like transitions to like, his emotions and him experiencing these intense emotions and then it becomes just the the soundtrack to that and it, it was just an interesting cool moment linda's dancing body outside is kind of that next level of the deadites messing with people i talked in my first review about how i think it's so cool that this is like a new type of evil when the movie came out that the deadites aren't just in one mode where they just want to kill, kill, kill. They want to screw with people. They want to mess around. They want to instill fear and just have fun. And then they'll try and kill you or convert you to a deadite. And I just, I love that aspect of it. Now the dancing body is the next level of that next craziness, more fun, more messing around. And I just like that. I think it's cool. It keeps it fresh and fun. The struggle with Linda's head is the first real slapsticky thing in the film. You could argue that him being chased through the cabin is kind of slapsticky, but like real slapsticky is him like trying like whacking the head against the walls and everything, and then he takes it to the shed and does his thing, um, which is a good scene. But the slapstickiness is just it doesn't jive with the first film to me. The speeding up of scenes adds to that comedic aspect, like I was talking about. It's Three Stooges esque. Uh, but for me, I, I kind of prefer to go without that nowadays. Ash chainsawing his own hand off shows his level of fight and that he's just unhinged enough to do whatever it takes to overcome these deadites and survive. And that's kind of the point you get with Ash in this film. Like, he does what it takes to survive in the first one, but it's taken to another level in the second film, obviously seen by that scene 
where people don't see coming if you're watching it the first time where he just like saw right down and how maniacal he is when he's doing it and like laughing basically he's like he's on it's like i was saying he's unhinged at this point and he will just do whatever to go forward like it iconic scene the whole sequence of his fight with his hand feels very tom and jerry cartoon to me do you guys think that put it in the comments like it, it totally feels like slapsticky to a point where it's a Tom and Jerry cartoon. And then it's awesome how he, like, shoots into the wall. There's a little bit of blood that comes out. And then it's just this gushing of blood just flying all over the place. Like, those types of things. Like, crazy amounts of blood in scenes are things that I always appreciate. I always find funny. I always find entertaining. Uh, good times. It's such a demanding role for Campbell is one thing that occurred to me while I'm watching this. It's very, it's very physical role for him. And the other thing is he's a large focus of the film. Even though there are other characters who show up, he's carrying the film. And for the first 40-ish minutes or so, it's just him pretty much. Until pe the other people make it to the actual cabin, it's mainly just him. You know, they do kind of have those cutaways where they're showing the other people getting there, but they're so quick. The idea to have Deadites change in many ways keeps things feeling extremely fresh, and you really don't know at that point, you know, what's coming next. And that's cool. Like, you want to be watching a film like that where you're just like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Like, what's coming? And that's great that they do that because all the changes that were done in the first film, they do a little bit of that in the second film, but then they go further. Uh, biggest example is, you know, Henrietta, you know, when her head, like, turns into this other weird looking demon and then it elongates into this huge neck you know things like that just cool keeps it fresh and cool the idea uh, or i said i don't understand how the deadites blood is green all of a sudden and that's that's when it came when uh ash was chopping up ed after he turned then he's just like you know chop him up with the axe and it's just this green blood flying i don't understand that it seems very out of place because at no other point was the deadite blood green. So I don't under... Like, it just doesn't make sense. I don't understand why they did that. They could have just used the red blood they've been using. I just don't... I don't get it. I don't get it. The reappearance of the hand is awesome when it eventually happens, when it's holding... Um, oh, shoot. What's her, what's her name? Bonnie Joe. When it's holding Bonnie Joe's hand, she's like, why are you still ha holding my hand, Jake? And he's like, I'm not holding your hand. And you see it's the hand. That reemergence of the hand is awesome because you forgot about the hand at that point. Like, you literally thought that Ash took care of that problem when he shot it through the wall. But you didn't see it die. And then it shows up again. And I love that. And then it plays a role later when it stabs Annie in the back with the Kandarian dagger. Love it. I, I love the reemergence of the hands. Very smart. When the tree ends up going out after Bonnie Joe outside, you think they're headed to another rape scene. And they kind of allude to it with the way it kind of like touches her face and kind of like rips her clothes a bit. But then they back away from it. So it's kind of one of those things where it teases you where it's like, uh, you're like, oh no, are they going to do the same thing again? And then they don't. Then she just gets dragged through the, through the forest. There's always that character that has to force everyone else into an even more dangerous situation. And that ends up being Jake in this film. There's always that really stupid, stupid character who does exactly what you shouldn't be doing in that situation. And that's Jake taking Ash and um, Annie at gunpoint and taking them outside, which is where all the evil is. And he knows that. He's a moron. But what you don't see coming about that is that Ash then ends up getting turned again. And he becomes evil. And that's something that doesn't really happen in films. I wrote about that. The main hero, the, the hero, the main hero being controlled by evil as much as Ash is in this film is a very, very uncommon thing in horror. It's a very uncommon thing in film in general. When you have the protagonists, they're usually very, very, very pure. We've gotten away from that over time. But back in 1987, it was still geared more towards that. So the fact that there's substantial amounts of time in this film where Ash is evil Ash is crazy it's 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 a cool concept though it's something that people probably didn't see coming and it messes with your head because you're just like wait but he's the good guy is he done being the good guy now because he's trying to kill these people as a deadite but gets rid of that i laugh at <laughs> i laugh at the scene when annie holding jake's uh, annie's holding jake's legs 
when he got pulled down into the basement under the hatch by Henrietta. And she's just, like, holding his legs, and there's just, like, an insane amount of blood just gushing out, gushing out, gushing out. And she keeps holding his legs like she's going to, like, save him or something. Where do you think all that blood's coming from? He's done. He's done. I love that scene. Maybe my favorite scene in the film. One of the most badass scenes in movie history is when Ash ends up attaching that chainsaw to his wrist, his stump of a wrist, and then he uses it to cut the barrel off of that shotgun, making a sawed-off shotgun. And just that image of him with the chainsaw hand and the sawed-off shotgun. One of the most badass things in film, period. Do you agree with me? You should. Between Ash going back to normal from looking at the necklace, which I talked about before, and Henrietta pausing for Annie singing the lullaby, because that's how... It doesn't, you know, it doesn't turn Henrietta back, but it, there's a moment where it's kind of like it's Henrietta repossessing her body to a degree, because it pauses the deadite. That establishes that there is a way to turn people back from being deadite, which is interesting because... It, it then goes back to what was introduced in the first film of the Deadites being more of like a possession thing. Not so much as like getting bitten and it's like a zombie. Even though I do talk about in my first review about this feeling like the next evolution of zombies. Um, it's just got that possession aspect to it. And especially because it can be driven out somehow. And what it has to do with mainly it seems like is something very sentimental having to do with a loved one. So it's interesting. And then if, you know, if Ash would kind of understand that, I think it would make it even harder for him to come to terms with the fact that he killed a bunch of people who had who were, you know, possessed by deadites. Ash is the only survivor at the end <clears throat> yet again, which I don't know if people saw that coming or not. I think when I first watched it, I assumed that Annie would probably end up living because she kind of becomes a love interest. So I was like, oh, she'll live. But then she gets stabbed in the back with the hand. I was just like, okay, which I like, you know, keep people guessing. And then the mid the medieval ending, um, it's so wacky. It is so out there. I think that's another thing that kind of just made me not love the tone of this as much as the first one. But one thing that I think the very end with the medieval times does indicate and does demonstrate that I think is a cool thing is that it basically states that Ash is doomed to an eternity of battling the Deadites. Which is basically what ends up happening. Uh, because, you know, Army of Darkness and then the show. Uh, obviously he has a stint of not dealing with that stuff, but, you know, it happens again. So I like that. Um, and then some uh, my final thought. So what pervades this film, much like the first one, is a deep fear of nature because of the unknowns it harbors. Now, I'm not saying that from the aspect of that Raimi meant this. I'm just saying as one of the things that ends up being in horror films in general is a kind of fear of nature, and that ties into human nature. It's used a lot in horror and is most likely due to a long-standing human fear of nature because it can't fully be controlled. It's this kind of unknown of nature. You know, humans can control things to a degree when they're in an actual, like, city or suburbs or whatever. When you get out into the middle of the woods and it's just you and a, a bunch of friends, you're kind of at the whims of nature. And nature from the aspect of animals there, in this case, a, you know, uh, an, uh, an ancient evil that people didn't know existed, or, you know, the elements, you know a hurricane, a, you know, storm, whatever, you know. So it it's just something that's embedded in humanity of kind of having a bit of a fear of nature and mainly, you know, not as much people who live in rural areas, but mainly where we've gone for, you know, people living in suburbs and people living in the city. So it, it for that reason, ends up serving as a good backdrop for horror just because it brings this element of kind of like anything can happen because it's not very well controlled. Whereas if it's happening in the city, a lot of the horror elements would probably be tied more to other humans or human stuff. Or at least they're in an environment where things are controlled human-wise, if that makes any sense. But just my theory. Anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. I need to give this a rating. Oh. 
So I, I gave a four and a half to the Evil Dead. So this is definitely not a four and a half. I think for me, yeah, I think it's, I quite like it, but I don't know that I can give it a four. So I'm going to go three and a half. Yeah, I'm going to go three and a half. Obviously, you can tell I'm between a three and a half and a four. I just feel like it's a little more appropriate for a three and a half. I think it is one less than The Evil Dead, uh, but still good, obviously. So, um, yeah, that's my rating. Anyway, uh, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, that's your best way to repay me if you like any videos I do, this one or any other one. Uh, it's really quick for you to do, and it means so much to me. It really does, and it means a lot for my channel growth, so I would appreciate that. And if you are going to do that, also hit the notification bell. That way you know anytime I'm putting up new videos for reviews or doing live streams or sometimes I do other types of videos, which, you know, I haven't done any of those in a while, but it'll happen. Anyway, uh, regardless, thanks for taking your time to watch this, and until next time, keep it brutal.